This week on CrossFeed. Giving up Christianity for lunch. Praying for test scores. Robert Schuler at the Crystal Cathedral says, Don't ask, don't tell. Saints, preserve them. And when is charity not charitable? Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, Pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Welcome on this, the very first day of spring. Yes, we survived winter. <laughs> of course, for us in Massachusetts, that means we can still get snow for about another three or four weeks yet. But hey, we're going, we're moving. It's the day, we're past the vernal equinox. <laughs> So it should get better from now on. Yeah. So, hey, we actually had a tease day on Friday. It was 70 degrees. And I went to the gym in just my shorts. It was so nice. It was the first time I'd done that since September. So You may dispense with the pleasantries, Commander. I just blanked on the entire past week. <laughs> busy, busy time. Yeah, I got it. It's, it's Lent. Um, it's lunch. Busy time. So, you know what, I can, just... I, I, can, I can comment on one thing, and I may have mentioned this in the past, but it's something that I really appreciate being here. Um, this past Wednesday night, Lent, all right, Lent service, um, but my kids had a concert at school. And so um, here, when that happens... And I can't be at the service um, because my kids have the concert. They say, Pastor, your family's more important. You need to go and be a dad and, and go to their concert and support your family. And uh, and the elders will cover the service. And uh, and so when they do, we don't have communion because we usually have communion on, um, on at all of our regular services, and including our Wednesday night services. And so we don't have communion. I write a sermon uh, for one of them to read. And um, and and they just they do the service that way, and the people go to sleep just as well as they do when they're there. <laughs> we're actually something that that I was debating about, and, and we're still discussing it, and, and haven't um, made a decision. And it, it, and it may end up that it putting becomes pillows a moot in the pews. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody gave some cushions um, from a, a church that got some like better ones. And we put them all up in the front. They're sort of movable, just sort of like big, long pillows. And uh, and we put them all up in front to encourage people to sit toward the front. People would get them and, like, carry them back to the back pews and put them back there. <laughs> so that didn't work. But um, no, they, uh, I, I appreciate them, you know, doing that. And, and they said, well, you know, um, when when we take care of our pastor's families, and and make sure that they're able to to fulfill their responsibilities as um, as fathers and husbands. We find that it works better for the church. Um, which, you know, that's a pretty biblical concept. So, uh, uh, but it's it's something that I really appreciate. Um, oh, but what we were talking about doing was um, was the because we use the uh, PowerPoint and. Um, and video clips and all kinds of stuff. I had a clip of the Japanese tsunami in my sermon this morning and stuff. And, um, and the, we, we talked about just having me stand in the pulpit, preach, record it, um, you know, video record it, And then just when it gets to the sermon part of the service that that slide comes up, it'll have an embedded video of me preaching and it would just, still have me preaching the sermon that way. And uh, so it's not live, and, and some people would sort of be offended by it not being live, but at the same time it's the pastor instead of a lay person doing it. And so... Well, I don't think anybody would be offended. I really don't. I think we live in a media age. People are used to it. You know, they, they said, you know, they call it best of person. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> speaking of Lent, are you being a Muslim for Lent this year? Mm, no, no, I didn't give up my uh, my Christianity. 
say I, you know, I gave up beer and wine again for Lent this year, so I, I'm being a good boy again. Uh, but um, yeah, so there's uh, Ferguson, Missouri. It sits outside St. Louis. Uh, remember that little town? Uh, and there's an Episcopal bishop out, Episcopal priest out there by the name of Stephen Lawler, and um, he's the uh, rector part time of uh, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. And for the 40 days of Lent, he decided to adopt the uh, rituals of Islam in order to have a deeper understanding of the faith. So um, he uh, would do the five days, the, 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 the five uh, prayers each day facing east towards Mecca. And uh, he would pray to Allah. He studied the Quran. And he also worked on uh, following the Islamic dietary restrictions and abstain from alcohol and pork. And towards the end, he's going to have, he wanted to do a mini Ramadan by fasting from dawn to sunset uh, during Holy Week. Although I wonder if he stays up and parties all night like they do in Iraq <laughs> during that time. <laughs> We've been we've been talking in, about Islam in our Bible class and stuff, and we talked about it. My son, uh, Shosh, said, "Yeah, it's his man. Said, this is one big party. They sleep all day and they just party all night." <laughs> <laughs> it kind of blows the whole fasting thing, doesn't it? Fast during the day. <laughs> yeah, you the sleep rules. through it. Yeah, but is, isn't that sort of like uh, you know? I, I always enjoy when the Roman Catholics call it fasting. Um, the, the when you can call in all you can eat fish fry fasting <laughs> like, like all you can eat fast <laughs> what <laughs> so uh, right so he's he's uh, facing being defrocked if he continues in in those endeavors the um uh, bishop of the episcopal diocese of missouri uh, george wayne smith said he can't be both a Christian and a Muslim. If he chooses to practice as a Muslim, then he would, by default, give up his Christian identity and priesthood in the church. Um, yeah, I I tend to agree with the um, with with the bishop here. Um, it a lot of it sort of depends on on how he's approaching it. Right now, for instance, you take uh, something like a um, like Christian yoga. All right, yoga is a. I, I've always had had problems with that because yoga is a Hindu discipline. Um, at the same time, Does it have picnic baskets. <laughs> that's yogi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay, sorry. All right. Um, so, in sort of most, um, or at least some of the, the sort of modern. Uh, Western yoga stuff that I've seen, it's really more about sort of balance and relaxation techniques and breathing and, and stuff like that, and and not so much emphasis on the um, what they call sort of body energy and in in uh, in the Far East they call it chi. I forget what it's called in um, in uh, Hinduism, but you know that that sort of mystical energy thing, and. Um, and and so you know th there's nothing wrong with relaxation techniques and stretching and and things like that um so it, it sort of depends on on your approach to it and but of course at some point you got to stop calling it yoga you know and um uh, that's sort of my biggest concern that i think they call it yoga because um that's sort of where they're starting with and and then just sort of getting rid of all of the religious aspects of it, but um, at the same time, when you when you take a something that is specifically a Hindu discipline into a Christian church, then you sort of question what you know. What are you doing here? Um, I don't know. Unitarians do it all the time. They take you know for the religion, they strip it of everything, make it fall, continue on. But you know, no different. Uh, you know, the same thing. Okay, but back to our buddy here, who's okay. I mean, he says he's doing it in order to try to understand what it's like to be Muslim. You know, that, that, you know, he says, that especially as, uh, the, um, Congress is having their, 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 um, you know, their, their things about the, uh, their hearings on radicalized Islam and stuff, that, you know, he, 
he wants to learn more about it, and he said, I could read scholarly articles, I could be reading books, but it seems to me you understand it by actually practicing it. Well, the problem is, though, you're not really practicing it. Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing, he's doing the rituals. You're going through the motions, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, if you're going to be Muslim, I mean, the first, uh, you know, of the, you know, five pillars is, you know, there is no God but Allah and um, um, and, and Muhammad is his prophet. Well, that is, you know, if you're affirming that, and it just means just that you just don't say it. I mean, you affirm it. You believe it. It is, it is your core identity. Right. That's what it means to be Muslim. Well, then you're at complete odds with um, Christianity. Yeah, you can you can pray five times a day. You can get on the ritual. You can follow the hand, the correct hand motions, and you can do the correct wa ritual washings and stuff. But as long as you're saying Jesus, and he's not a prophet, you really but you confess he's the son of God. But you can't understand what it is to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know that's sort. Of, it's like saying, "Well, I want to know what it's like to be gay." Um and to, to experience what they have to deal with in our culture or whatever. And that seems to be with him talking about the hearings and stuff like that, you know, um, what it's like to be, you know, in that case it's, it's, or, you know, or for that, better, maybe a better example. All right. To be of an ethnic minority, like what it's like to be black. All right. You know what? There's no way for you to, you can, you know, there's just there's no way for you to really experience that and and know what that's like. All right. Uh, one of my favorites was um, the probably better one was uh, a guy from Columbia University who did a decided he wanted to do a cross cultural exchange type thing for a semester and go to what he thought was a, a kind of a foreign land and a foreign culture. He went to Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia for a semester. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that. <laughs> you know, and what that was like. And he said it was, you know, great people, but it was completely different. It just kind of, wow, these people are really different from what I'm used to in college. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't go out and party. They don't get drunk. They don't sleep around, you know, uh, and they have this real faith in God. But, you know, could he really understand what it was all about? He could, he could, he could watch. He could experience. He could observe because he didn't really didn't believe in any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. He couldn't really understand what it was all about. Right. You know, yeah. so I think that's the thing. I mean, now this is different. I think he said another one. It says, uh, you know, uh, in 2009, the Reverend Ann Holmes Redding was defrocked two years after she embraced Islam because her bishop of a priest of the church cannot be both Christian and a Muslim. Um, now, in that case, she actually embraced the faith. You question yeah. why she was defrocked and why she didn't, you know, sort of resign. It always took her two years. Yeah. But uh, it sounds like they did it to her, not the other way around. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. But, you know, yeah. And, you know, she didn't see the inconsistency there, that she was practicing syncretism? You know, two contradictory Dale. religions at once? Dale. She's Episcopalian. <laughs> okay? Yeah, I, I mean, suppose. I mean, seriously, you get some, you know, well, you, can, you get into liberal Christianity. And, you know, you know, I remember, you know, visiting the, the, you know, the, the UCC church and the guy said, you know, well, I'm, I'm pretty Unitarian, but the church is Trinitarian. And he had no problem, you know, being pastor of a church that he doesn't agree with the faith, he doesn't agree the doctrine with. I mean, go figure, it's man. The church, uh, anyway. do what you want to. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that the guy uh, said um, later on, he says, you know, he had no problem reconciling his Episcopal views with those of Islam. Uh, <laughs> Either he doesn't understand Islam or that doesn't say much about the Episcopal Church. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I've got it. My heart goes out to the rest of the Anglican Communion or the majority of the rest of the Anglican Communion. I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's going to be attending uh, an Anglican seminary, like in, in England, and 
and he's frustrated with the Episcopal Church. And because he's like, they're, they're total fringe, you know, and, and the Anglican communion can't figure out how to rein them in. So it's, yeah, the, we need, you know, like there needs to be a separate Anglican church within the United States. That's well, not, there is one. There is oh, one. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Out of, yeah, the North American Anglican communion, which is seeking full, uh, 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 to be a, 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 a literal, I don't think, and to be fully recognized and to have actually have the Episcopal Church be recognized. Yeah, and, so, and that's actually but, what needs to happen. Yeah, but after his bishop said, give it up, he did. He, he, this guy did say, no, nope, no, nope, I'm re reversing course. Uh, job's more important than anything else. So, yeah, I mean, you notice he's not like saying, he's he's saying, well, I didn't see his big deal, you know? So, yeah, it wasn't a big deal to him, but, well, you know, don't want him to get mad at me, don't want to lose my job over just a mm -hmm. little experiment, so... You know, it's, it's interesting because they, they asked him Muslim what he thought. He said he was not offended with it. People, we welcome people. People can come and watch us pray at the mosque or just pray if they want to. Uh, you know, but again, observing, watching, and, you know, trying to do it are two different things. Uh, I think that, I think the confession, the Lutheran confession say something about that, you know, uh, the, the whole area of, you know, what's, you know, at what point does what you're doing reflect what you really believe? Mm. You know, right. uh, so. Yeah, well, absolutely. I was thinking there was something that went right along with this one. Well, uh, this kind of ties in a bit with the Crystal Cathedral um, story. Oh, I well, actually, I was going to go over here to the prayer service there in Baltimore. I guess it's okay. You know, as long as they didn't you know, do an Islamic prayer in Baltimore, we might be okay. Either That's way. Rough. Either way. So uh, let's go east. Uh, and then we'll go west. Okay. Uh, now, I... <laughs> Man, I don't even know what to even do with this. Um, you're going to have to pick up... A, you're going to have to put a picture of this flyer up. Yeah, now, yeah, This yeah. was not a public school. They have the if you're Maryland... watching the video, it, it was in the opening. Yeah, Maryland uh, State Achievement Test or something like that, the MSAs. And uh, there's the school, and uh, so I had a flyer went home, and it said, All things are possible, only believe. The faculty and staff are working hard to prepare our students for the MSA. Let's come together as one in prayer, teachers, students, and parents, and ask God to bless our school to pass the MSA, Jeremiah 33.3. Three. I'm not even sure what that verse says. <laughs> he will do it again. Everyone is invited. And it's a half an hour, Saturday, 10 to 10.30, and where at, in the name of the high school, Ten Tilgman or, Tilgman or something like that. Oh, man. Yeah, Tench Tilgman Elementary slash Middle School. All right, Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Like passing okay. standardized tests. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Okay. Well, I mean, they said, you know, they've done this the last couple of years. It's been huge. I'm not sure where I come with this. Okay. ACLU, of course, is saying this is totally, you know, proselytizing and completely wrong. I'm not so sure. Well, it's not. Well, hold on, hold on. Nobody's being required to go. It's a Saturday. Uh, it's optional. Uh, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, not being led during the school day. You, you know, you know. I'm trying to look and saying, okay, since there's no coercion here or anything, um, then you know, what is the, uh, you know, is there anything wrong with it? Would there? I mean, our church is, uh, you know, doing these uh, uh, community dinners, and um, the, the principal, the, the the superintendent said, oh, this sounds great. I know some of our parents, families, could use this. Send us a flyer. We'll put it out. 
even though it's being held at a church, we we you know we even said you know we open with prayer, but that's fine. Yeah, it's always being made to go. We'll just advertise it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, I'm just. Well, this you know this reminds me of, um, <laughs> and I'm drawing a blank. What do you what do you call the 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 service that you have um like right before graduation? Baccalaureate. Baccalaureate. Thank you. I just went blank on the word. All right. This is sort of like a baccalaureate service, but it's like we want them to graduate, not to sort of um, acknowledge them graduating and pray for them as they go out. Um, so it's it's very similar. Now, with a baccalaureate service, now, and we used to have those when I was in Iowa, all right? And and the way you do it is the, it, the school will promote it, but they're not running it. It, the students have to initiate it. This you have to basically the. I mean, and it was funny the way that it would happen is the like the principal would come to our ministerial association meeting and say, um, "Okay, what's the plan for baccalaureate this year?" And 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 which of you has somebody in your church that's a senior this year that would be willing to initiate it? <laughs> Because initiating it had to come from a student, <laughs> but he would help. You know, he would work with the pastors to help find a student that would work. And when I was in uh, Illinois, the, um, the 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 ministerial lines did it. Well, um, we would we would work with the students to um, to organize it and everything. Yeah. Well, uh, we we organized it. We did everything, and the. Um, yeah, you know, the, the school would just say the, the you know, Loves Park, McChesney Park Ministerial Alliance is sponsoring a baccalaureate service, which will be held, um, you know, uh, the afternoon, or the, the night before the, the graduation in the, the, the auditorium. And if the students choose to go, uh, they need to wear the graduation robes. You know, I mean, that was just it. I mean, it was, you know, there was... You know, it was just put on that we were sponsoring it. It was going to be held there, and you know, students weren't required. But if they did, they they would be asked to wear their their, their graduation robes and sit as a a, a group. Mm-hmm. So now I like this principal of the the the, the, the head of the principals union. This guy, man, I I never thought I'd see a, a, a teachers' education union person I like before. <laughs> the only individuals I hold accountable for these injustices for Ms. Jean, she's the principal, are the narrow-minded politicians some fifty years ago for removing prayer from our schools. Once prayer is removed from our schools, the respect for our teachers and administrators has been increasingly out of control. <laughs> hey, don't hold back, uh, Jimmy Giddings. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> you know. I, as I as I look at this, um, and the you know the sort of desire to to have this, um, on the one hand, my gut reaction is, how about you work on improving your um, improving your education, praying for that your education be um, effective, um, instead of praying for test scores. Um, well, I don't think, that, but the later on it talked about what the, what did they pray for um, that. Um, that 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 students be um, calm. That they oh here, there it is. Um, uh, the, the group prayed for our children for testing for the families to make sure everyone stayed healthy and kept their minds focused. You're still praying you for know. test scores there. How about at the, having it at the, I mean, no have it at the beginning of the year then, and pray for yeah. uh, for an effective year of educating. I mean, when I when I used to take tests and stuff, I used to pray before my my tests in college and seminary, and I would just pray, God, just help me keep focused now. Uh, what I've studied, help me to re, you know remember it, you mm-hmm. know, and you know just 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 help me to focus on, on what I'm doing now. I mean, I I think that that's a pretty innocuous thing. You're not saying, God, you know, we don't care if we these guy these kids study or not, you know, because they're doing extra Saturday sessions. They're you know working hard. They're stressing. Uh, hey, and there's this one group, you know, as opposed to another school, that put together a rap video called My Pencil. <laughs> you know, that's how they prepared for this thing. I mean, come on. I... Oh, so, man. no, I... little, little, little middle school Snoop Dogs about their pencil there, you know, that's, that's all. <laughs> little 50 sons out there tweeting about the, you know, tsunami making jokes. Um, 
Now, I, I guess if I have one or the other, I think I'd rather have the prayer group than the rapping group. <laughs> All right. And you my know, pencil, I stick it up. Yeah, and I, I know. Anyway, I don't. See, the, the fact that it's not, like, part of the day or, you know, part of the school day or anything, it doesn't really bother me that they want to do this. I I, th I see it as being just like a baccalaureate service, all right? It's there for anybody that's interested in it. You're not, you know, it's just there. And, right. um, and, and, and you, you know, most people won't go, and there's not going to be any stigma for anybody that doesn't go. It's, you know... At the same time, I see this, and and the, that sort of I, I saw that quote about the um, about the prayer in schools thing, and I've never been a fan of prayer in schools. All right, not organized prayer in schools anyway. Um, you know, if if kids wanna if if kids wanna you know pray before they sit down and eat, or or even if a bunch of kids sitting around a lunch table wanna join hands and and pray or something like that, I, you know, that's certainly within their rights. Um, having it sort of come over the school PA system there, that's just, you know, a dangerous thing to do. Um, where the thing that, that I see here is, as being advantageous, um, or, or, uh, the thing that kind of sticks out of my mind, I'm sorry, um, is that what's, what's going on here, the, the sort of, no prayer in schools or, or, or the, even the, the sort of people being offended, um, by having a service to pray for test scores, pray for clarity of mind, call it what you want. Okay. Um, is this is a symptom of our society. All right. This just shows that we live in a post church culture, right? For the first time, you know, and, and I used to say for the first time since Constantine, or since pre-Constantine, but really, in essence, for the first time in history, we live in a culture where religion is, is really sort of seen as irrelevant to people's lives. For the first time since Constantine came to power, we live in a culture where Christianity is, is seen as irrelevant. Uh, Reality-wise, no, that uh, I, I would disagree. During G in Jesus' day, uh, the, you know, first century Rome, religion was considered irrelevant to most people's lives. You know, the, the gods and goddesses were there, and yeah, they, they burned the incense of the emperor, but they really didn't think the gods and goddesses did anything. They, they, they had a practical atheism. You know, they... they, they Okay. And, and, and superstition and uh, occult practices were huge. Um, really, it, it, I mean, and, and even reading American history, I mean, what happened between the two Great Awakenings? You know, people were pretty secular. Uh, leading up to the third, you know, the third Great Awakening, the evangelical revival of the 40s and the 50s. You know, well, well, again, the 1920s. <laughs> 1920s was not a particularly religious time in America. Uh, you know, there is a, you know, but there is a marginalization of the church that I think we feel a lot more in the 21st century than what we have, uh, certainly in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, and, and, and it's different. Uh, but, uh, by the way, out of 400 students and their parents, you know, uh, 25 kids and 30 parents actually showed up at the prayer thing. The principal didn't lead it, she prayed with it. Uh, so you're talking about just under 10% actually showed up. So 90% of the kids didn't even show up. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't say there's a stigma and an ostracization to showing up when 90% of the people didn't. Uh, and I really looked at this and I was really, at first I was really upset about it, but then I looked at it, it's, it was a weekend, it was a uh, 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 you know, nobody forced anybody to be there. There was no stigma if you didn't show up. Most of the students didn't. Yeah, it wasn't like you got extra credit or anything. Right. It was you know, purely yeah, voluntary. There were, there were, yeah, there are 25 other students and 30 parents. Okay, so there's 400 students that you're not even talking. You're you're talking five percent. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I mean. You know, I'm, I, I understand your concern about, you know, is it right to pray for, for a test score? 
And I don't of course, to think he's going through my as long as there's math tests, there'll be prayer in public schools. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, uh, yeah, Maryland school assessments. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I just, I don't know. Then, then the other one is me is this uh, Jessica Schiller uh, for Advocates for Children and Youth who doesn't like uh, the standardized testings at all. The issue for me isn't religion. It's just that there's so much pressure on schools to get their scores up for fear of punitive consequences. There are these links that, peop- that people at schools feel they need to go to in order to get their kids pumped up to do well on a test because the test has become the end-all, be-all for learning. Whether it's prayer or video or pep rallies, it's the mass hysteria because they're all scared. Lady, do you realize that there were kids graduating from school who couldn't read their diplomas? <laughs> okay, before I get, off, get get going anymore on that comment, let's move on here. Okay, now let's go to the Crystal Cathedral. All right. Uh, and I'll let you talk about uh, your hero there, Robert Schuller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, most of you probably heard of Robert Schuller of the Hour of Power uh, at Crystal Cathedral. He uh, retired a few months ago, and uh, his his son... Uh, was supposed to replace him. Then his son resigned. So now his daughter is in charge. And um, now they're doing things that he's not real thrilled with. Uh, they have a given a, a covenant to the choir members that they asked him to sign. And the covenant describes choir members as people who confess Jesus as their Savior, consider the Bible authoritative and infallible, and understand the cathedral's position that marriage is between one man and one woman. And Robert Schuller says, um, who's retired, but still hasn't, you know, this is one of those guys that really needs to just sort of go join another church or something like that, because otherwise his influence is, is too, uh, too heavy there. Uh, he says, I have a reputation worldwide of being tolerant of all people and their views. I'm too well educated to criticize a certain religion or group of people for what they believe in. It's called freedom. Yep. Um, and then, uh, oh, another daughter said, um, uh, uh, he's bound to disagree with the church leaders. The organization and his voice are no longer seamless. They can no longer go back to being that way. You know, I get the idea. I uh, maybe I don't know if you did, but I think his kids are more conservative theologically than he is. It doesn't take much. Right? <laughs> That's true. All right, look, and and I want you to understand, people that are watching this. I, all right, I'm not like bad mouthing Robert Schuler, saying he's not a Christian or, or anything like that. All right, but you've got to understand that this is a guy that publicly has said, "I don't talk about sin. I don't use that word." All right. I mean. This is, and I'm not misrepresenting him here. And if somebody thinks I am, please call me on the carpet, okay? But, but the reality is, is he wants people to feel good about who they are, okay? Somebody this morning in Bible class asked me, because we were talking about trust um, versus forgiveness, and someone said, does God, anywhere in the Bible, trust humanity or, or trust individuals? I said, well... The psalmist says, trust in God, not in princes. Um, He entrusted us with his son. We crucified him. And he sent him specifically because he knew we would do that to him. You know, he entrusted us with the gospel, which we haven't handled all that well. Um, Certainly haven't, you know, done as much as we could with it. Um. No, actually, the Bible paints a pretty lousy picture of humanity when it comes to how trustworthy we are, all right? Um, and, and that's why the big emphasis on, is on God's forgiveness. That's how much we need it, because we've gotten ourselves into such bad straits, right? And so, you know, to make people feel good about themselves is sort of missing the point of the Bible. Well, you know, I, yeah, well, I, his, he's Norman Vincent Peale on a little bit of steroids, I mean, I remember his ad, his his book on the Beatitudes, were the Be Happy Attitudes. Yeah, I'm not sure this is all about being happy. Um, so I, you know, I, um, um, I, I, 
you, I think you can preach about sin without talking, without saying sin. I think, you know, some people might hear that word and just, you know, but he's in a different place than that. Let's be real honest. Um, so, uh, 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 and I think it's interesting that, um, you know, I mean, just the fact that, you know, he says, you know, to be, to be in the choir, you have to confess Jesus as your savior. Um, which I thought was interesting. Um, because I know one time he had Dr. Laura, you know, at his church speaking, you know, and this is during, this is during her Judaism phase. Yeah. You know, oh, is she not phase. Jewish anymore? Well, she's no longer an Orthodox Jew. No, she has been for a number of years. Uh, uh and she, uh, yeah, I remember because she said she found it unfulfilling. She's like, you know, I'm looking for this relationship with God and I see these Christians have this really neat relationship with God and I just don't feel it. Hmm. And so she just, you know, kind of gave up. The, 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 but still, you know, you know, you're having this Orthodox Jewish person speak in, in your worship service. You know, mm-hmm. I has problems with that. Uh, but didn't this strike you kind of odd? The covenant. I mean, of all the things you can, you know, ask people to confess and affirm, Christ is my Savior. The Bible is the word of God, and oh yeah, no gay marriage. Uh, <laughs> I just kind of thought that was kind of... Yeah, it's kind of quirky. I mean, you know, I, I would think before that you might want to have something about... Well, I mean, I guess it's got Jesus as your Savior, but like, how about the Trinity? <laughs> I think that's a little more important, you know? Yeah, uh, but maybe it's an issue that you know they're they're dealing with. Uh, my guess is that it's an issue they're dealing with in the choir. That you had some people in there who are affirming of, of homosexuality. I mean, when you got you got that many members, um, uh, and and a church that's you know has been known for being tolerant and open. Um, that yeah, you're probably going to have people coming in with 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 um, non biblical attitudes in that area. Mm-hmm. At the same time, making them sign a document, I don't know if that's really going to fix anything, you know, as opposed to like actually sitting down with them on an individual basis and, you know, discussing these things. Right. My, uh, I mean, it's interesting because we have a, a, one of our churches up here um, that has a lot of, that has, I don't know, a lot of, but has some non-Christians singing in their choir, um, you know, because it, it's, it's a church that has an extremely good music program and people who like high culture, um, right. you know, will go there. Uh, and uh, there, there's some people who have some beautiful voices in their choir because it's a very good choir, but, you know, who, who are not Christian, who are not members of the church. But the pastor says, you know, how, you know, but says, you know, they're, they're in worship, they're hearing the word, they're, you know, they're, they're moving along that direction. Right. Yeah, you know, we'll see how, we'll let God do his thing. If they want to sing in the choir, they can sing. Uh, he doesn't have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I feel the same way. So, so, but I'm wondering if it was beginning to be dis- some of these stuff is beginning to cause some dissent. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, it, you don't just sort of like pull this out of the air. Oh, you know what? We really need we need we need a don't be gay um, covenant for our choir. You know. <laughs> right. I have an idea. Something with Proposition Eight came up, and this is you know, and this that this is the stance of our church, and mm-hmm. you need to agree to, to agree to it. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, and, and you know, we're not given that context. Um, right. But uh, This is from the Huffington Post, you know, right. or is that now? No, now it's AOL, AOL, that's right. Yeah, it's the Daily Beast bought Newsweek. So, you know, which I haven't been able to figure out which is which, is which anymore. You know, it's the, you know, yeah, so. the Weekly Beast now or something like that. <laughs> uh, the News Weekly Beast. Um Oh, let's move on here. Uh, so, so you think anybody's going to be venerating uh, his uh, uh, relics there when he dies? <laughs> is that what he's hoping for? <laughs> Man, this is this is creepy. All right, maybe, maybe yeah. it's just because I'm Lutheran. The cathedral. Who's the bishop of the Who's the bishop of this cathedral? Yeah, the cathedral is supposed to be the seat of the bishop. Yeah, so is Bob Schuler the, the 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 bishop of the Christian cathedral? I don't know. Go ahead, but yeah, this right. is creepy. All right, uh, so. Pope John Paul II, all right, died a number of years ago, okay, and um, and so he's uh, they're they're trying to fast track him to sainthood, 
right? Which already, you know, we as Lutherans are going, um, we're all, all Christians are saints. Um, but, you know, there's the Roman Catholic understanding of sainthood is different. And, um, and so because they're, they're already moving in that direction, um, well, if you got saints, then you can have relics. And so they have a, <clears throat> all right, um, the blood of the Holy Father is the, is, is the greatest relic that's remained with us, an expression of his enormous love and attachment to us, as well as an opportunity to be united to the person that we loved. Our prayer to God is made easier through the blessed person. The blood that will be built into an altar in Krakow in a Krakow church was drawn for medical tests at Rome's uh, uh, a clinic. Um, it be, shortly before John Paul's death on April 2nd, 2005, and is now um, uh, in the possession of this priest. Uh, sorry, the names are kind of tough to pronounce. The blood is to be encased in the altar after the beatification. Um, so the the person that, that has the blood has not spoken publicly about whether there is more blood in his possession or why he chose to hold on to the blood taken for medical purposes from the dying pontiff. His office has so far declined requests from the Associated Press for interviews. All right. So, so all right. They t they took blood from from John Paul II for medical testing. Then somebody saved it so people could pray to it. Right? Like, why are people not going? That is so wrong. <laughs> I guess I just, all right, here's what I figured. I was thinking about this story and I figured out why when they did the funeral procession that they had him in this like fiberglass case so that you could see him, but nobody was allowed to touch him. All right. Because people would be trying to get, you know, they'd be like going up there with the fingernail clipper in their hand going, Oh, Holy Father, you're going to be so missed. Clip, you know. And, and it would either end up on eBay or eventually, you know, in somebody's amulet. The one chooses the wizard. This is, I'm just trying to figure out, like, what does this have to do with the Bible? Nothing. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the Bible. It's all tradition. The whole idea, the beautification, the relics. I mean, why were the people hanging around uh, uh, the Catholic Church there in Wittenberg on All Saints Day? So they could go look at the relics because they had the big collection of relics. And if you look at the relics, you get time out of purgatory. Wow, cool deal. Cool beans here. And uh, so, you know, it's the same type thing. And it makes a lot of money for the church. You know, so, uh, uh, um, you know, but one of these things is the, you know, uh, 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 you know, that, uh, um, you know, somebody, one woman already prayed at the relic as saying she was asking him to intercede on her behalf with God. I've already experienced so many acts of mercy from him, she said. Yeah, so the acts of mercy come from God. And it's only by his grace that he's willing to um to not completely thwart the any any possibility of those prayers being answered um right. when prayed, you know, to a relic instead of directly to God. Now, here is uh um I I they had this uh Zignu Mikolajo. I don't know if you're it's probably stuff. Uh, historian of religion with the Polish Academy of Sciences. And he said, uh, John Paul's memory would be uh, better preserved, served, if the church promoted the Pope's teachings or taught about his life, which was shaped by the suffering of the German ex occupation during World War II, the hardships of communist era life, poverty, and the loss of his mother. 
He was a contemporary man who lived through dramatic times and should be seen as a symbol of that collective fate rather than treated as a source of magic practices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, um, gotta agree with I'm that. having a hard time disagreeing with him. I don't know if I don't know if he's I don't think he's necessarily Christian, but uh, I have a hard time disagreeing with that. Uh, it's kind of what I see it too. Uh, now they do mention in the article. I thought this was you know interesting. Sort of where does all this relic stuff come from? All right. Well, originally Christians used to pray in the catacombs um, around the you know among the graves of the martyrs. All right, which partly or mostly was due to necessity. That was where they could safely gather without being rounded up and fed to the lions. All right. Um, so, but you know, eventually they were able to to build churches in that and. And so they brought some of these martyrs with them so that they could still sort of worship in the presence of the martyrs. Um, which, you know, we talk about the, um, the, the cloud of witnesses that, that when we worship God, that we're worshiping with the saints and angels. And, yeah, but uh, we don't bring them with us. No, we don't. <laughs> Although Luther and Melanchthon are, you know, buried, you know, with the, at the, by the pulpit and the lectern at the Castle Church there in um, Wittenberg, so... Sure, and a lot of churches have graveyards in their backyards. Uh, but uh, now, but some of this stuff is is kind of you know this is just a little scary though. I mean, because yeah, you know, while they prayed with them, they didn't pray to them. But yet, that's exactly what's taking place. Uh, you right. know, uh, Irina Anders, an 89 year old from Warsaw, uh, said Saint John, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, is a saint and deserves to be preserved for us. So we can go and pray and ask him for God's favors. Mm-hmm. You know, there, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, there, 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 there's Luther's complaints about the Catholic Church right there. Yep. You don't go to God, you go to somebody else, ask that person to go to God for you. Um, you, it's, it, you, you earn salvation. Uh, you know, you have the extra saint, good things to saints and they can dispense them. I mean, the whole, it's, it's amazing. You know, here in America, yeah, we kind of, they, the Catholics, you know, kind of poo-poo all that stuff, you know. Uh, but boy, there, you know, it's right there. It hasn't changed a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, speaking of saints, I just have to, because we had St. Patrick's Day this year, um, I saw this thing about uh, um, saying, you know, why why is it that St. Patrick's Day we get, um, you know, drunk on green beer and all that kind of stuff? If we're going to do that, we should really do it on St. Bridget's Day. Because she turned she turned bath water into beer, <laughs> so there Yuck. you go. But well, okay. she turned it into beer, you know. <laughs> it wasn't bath water anymore. I guess. Oh. Heard a bathtub gin. Never heard a bathtub beer. Anyway, <laughs> so um, but should you give money? Now this I thought was interesting. Um, this was kind of sad. Well, I, I, you know, I thought it would, uh, because you know, I think anybody who's listened to this knows I'm a lesser of two evil type guy. Um, and so, but uh, these two uh, Roman Catholic bishops, uh, Samuel Aquila and Paul Zippel from Fargo and Bismarck, uh, issued a document, Guidelines on Charitable Giving. And... <clears throat> It says, you know, that, that, that Roman Catholics should not give to or work with the March of Dimes, UNICEF, the Susan G. Coleman for the Cure, um, which, of course, is very well known for, for breast cancer, or Crop Walk, which really surprised me that they were against even Crop Walk. Um, uh, because those, uh, not because of the organization's main work, but because that they also support abortion rights, contraception, or stem cell research. Yeah. Uh, Which, no, specific, the, the article's wrong about that. It's because they support embryonic stem cell research. Right. Nobody's against okay. adult stem cell research. Right, okay, yeah. I'm, I, yeah, when I said that, I thought embryonic. I didn't even think about adult, so I just hear it. Right. right. It, you know, we know the difference, and we, we understand that, but i just yeah. like to point that out to make it clear to people that adult stem right. cell research is, everybody likes that. Right. Um, Obviously, Planned Parenthood is also on the list, which uh, makes perfect sense. Um, <clears throat> not the fact, if you happen to be in certain clinics, you can get killed, as we discovered in Philadelphia, but we won't go there. 
Uh, Catholics are compelled by the gospel to pr- responsibly promote the protection of human life, families, and the common good, the bishops wrote. We applaud the charitable giving and social justice efforts of our parishes, Catholic schools, and individuals. At the same time, we urge attentiveness to the possibility of endorsing an organization whose mission or affiliation may be morally objectionable or at least questionable. We call upon pastors, clergy, and the lay faithful to use guidelines based on the virtue of prudence and justice when making charitable giving decisions. Uh, so organizations that promote abortion, contraception, reproductive rights slash family planning or embryonic stem cell research or that seek to redefine marriage should not be supported by Catholics, the bishop said. Right. So this is this is something that really bothers me that I really struggle with, okay? Because uh like for instance, all right, this year I um I helped I did the or no I guess it wasn't this year, last year. Um the MDA lockup. All right, for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and um, and I I did some fundraising, not very successful, not as successful as I've been in in previous years, because it's not the first year I've done that. Okay. Now we know Dale, we just seem to leave him in jail. <laughs> I did have people ask how much they had to donate to keep me there. But, yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it wasn't bad. The the lockup this year, the this past time was at a country club. <laughs> it's Ours really swanky. Pizza Rio Unos. Well, the, when I was in Iowa, it was at a pizza ranch, you know. But uh, yeah, no. So it was, this guy came in like a, um, you know, this sort of not a limo, but like a real nice uh, um, sedan and and everything. It was, it was pretty swanky. But um, but yeah, the uh, I, when I was sort of soliciting. Uh, donations from people i got a note from somebody on facebook a fellow lcms pastor that says you know i uh, i've made it uh, i've made a decision that i'm not going to support any organizations that um that support abortion uh, or embryonic stem cell research and the mda has supported embryonic stem cell research and and you know he was saying that He's not against other people supporting it. This is just a decision he's made, and there's plenty of other charities that he could give his money to, you know, uh, uh, that way. And and I feel the same way. Okay, um, so I really struggle with this, and and it bothers me that organizations that are dedicated, like for instance, Susan G. Komen for the Cure. All right, it's all about breast cancer. All right, finding a cure for breast cancer. Why are they giving money? From people that they donate, they donated to help breast cancer, uh, or you know, find a cure. Why are they giving portions of that money to Planned Parenthood to be spent on abortions? Actually, I read why they were doing that. It really had nothing to do with the abortion side of Planned Parenthood. It was something else. I think it had to do with you know, uh, uh, cancer prevention. But money is fungible, right. and. So if you're giving money to, 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 you know, to, to, you know, to support, you know, whatever it is Planned Parenthood does with, with breast cancer, then that's money they don't have to spend. Then that, 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 that they get more money to spend somewhere else. Right. Uh, and it's, uh, but, you know, I mean, but just, just to be clear, it wasn't specifically to support uh, abortion per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's, uh, at least that was what they, that's, that was, I mean, so I recall that was the statement that they made because that yeah. question. Well, I got that same response when I wrote to Target, uh, you know, the department store or I don't know, anyway, discount store. Um, and because they support Planned Parenthood and I wrote to them and, and said, you know, why are you doing this? The, of all the places, why something so divisive, you know, you, you're, you're killing your potential customers. <laughs> and, and they're like, well, it's, it's specifically flagged to not be used for abortions. Well, <laughs> So then, yeah, it's just so they they spend other money on that, you know. Right, and, 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 but it's you know uh, again, you know, I, I, this is the, this is where you know you, 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 sometimes these partnerships you wonder. But it's interesting. For example, I talked about church world services. Um, you know, not long ago, Catholic Relief Services withdrew its name from the Church World Services umbrella group, the National Council of Churches, because some partners of Church World Service support the provision of contraceptives in their overseas missions programs. 
you know, I'm like, okay, you know, at what point, you know, okay, so some of their partners do this, but they themselves don't necessarily do this. At, at what point, you know, does lover A hit lover B and hit lover C? Um, yeah, how many degrees of separation do you have to have? Right, and okay, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, and, and I understand where, 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 the, where the pastor you talked to is coming from, okay, and I don't want to support, you know, uh, uh, embryonic stem cell research either, but now I've got this, you know, but, you know, but I'm trying to support MDA research, research on muscular dystrophy. This is a group that's doing some really cool stuff. Um, so do I, you know, say, no, I'm not going to, um, go with it. I'm not going to, to, to buy into this because of that. And so I'm going to let MDA people suffer. I, you know, I mean, you know, right. it, it gets, you know, I mean, you know, I've been, you know, uh, uh, of course, if it gets Jerry Lewis off television, <laughs> it may not be a bad thing. Anyway, um, I mean, some of these are obvious. Uh, uh, Planned Parenthood, I'd have no problem with. Uh, the American Association of University Women, because uh, they strongly support abortion rights and same-sex marriage and opposes parental choice in education, which, you know, yes, they do. Uh, you know, they're the ones who really get stuck with it. Of course, they, you know, a lot of university professors get stuck in these, those organizations. Uh, Amnesty International, because it abandoned its neutral stance at abortion and profited a poor pro- pro-abortion position. Um, See, that's another one. Amnesty International. What? Why? Why don't they just stay out of the abortion issue? Right. It makes no sense. That has nothing to do with who they are. Well, except for the, unless they see that as a, a a a reproductive freedom as a right of women. I I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just you know. No, I'm I know. Okay, I'm just telling you where they come from. But it's interesting to me, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, um, yeah, the March of Dimes said it's doing good work, but supports embryonic stem research, pre-implantation diagnosed for untreatable conditions, and mandatory contraceptive coverage for insurance plans. Well, I don't have a problem with the last one. Um, See, that one really bothered me. I think that one bothered me the most, right? The whole point of the March of Dimes is to help um, find cures for birth defects, all right? And um, I think, I, and I'm not super familiar with the March of Dimes, but it's all about little babies, okay? So now you think it's okay to kill little babies to save other little babies? Or Well, again, you know, from their perspective, you know, um, they're saying these are frozen embryos. You know, they 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 have a limited lifespan anyway. Um, and that's you know, they're going to be discarded eventually because you know you just can't keep them in chirogenic genus, you know, frozen forever. You know, let some good come out of them. I'm not saying I agree with their argumentation. That's where it is. But I, you got to understand, you got to be into a secular mindset. And yeah, you know, not see things the way we do. Another symptom. This is again. This is a symptom of what we were talking about before. Of it's the symptom of the culture that we live in. But it just really bothered me because to me it seems completely inconsistent. It's 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 like you're you're shooting yourself in the foot, right? You know, to have you know you're saying, oh yeah, we need to take care of of babies with birth defects unless we can get to them first and kill them. Oh, that's not right. No. You know. Well, if we can if we can get them before they're um, before they're implanted, if we can get them before you know, um, and and I have no problem with uh, with like genetic screening and things like that, so that people are aware of what. I don't have a problem with genetic screening, so that people are aware of you know if if they get pregnant, what possible uh, situations they could be dealing with. I mean, I think that that's really helpful. Um, so that people can prepare for that, or if they decide, you know what, I'm not prepared for that, um, I'm going to take measures so that I don't get pregnant, right? I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I do have a problem with, well, um, 
yeah, you're pregnant, let's find out if that baby's going to have any birth defects so that you can decide whether you want to kill them or not. All right? Now, if you're not ready to, if, if you say, boy, I can't handle th that sort of, you know, those kind of birth defects, okay, then let's talk about adoption. You know, and we have this weird, it seems like a stigma in our culture that, um, that we want to promote abortion rights, but we do it at the expense of adoption. They were so obsessed with making sure that people have the right to an abortion that we never really stop and think about the fact that adoption is such a better option, right? And if anything, what we should be doing, even if you believe in abortion rights, if we would sort of say, you know what, that's really not the best thing, and, and adoption is so much better, instead of which, you know, a lot of right-to-life groups have been doing that, but, um, you know, no longer do we say safe, legal, and rare. Um, now it's just legal. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you talk to people, and, and, and I mentioned this at our, um, our Sanctity of Human Life service that we had uh, a couple months ago, and it, I read a couple uh, people's experiences that had had abortions, and one was somebody that had also that had, had an abortion and then gave up a child for adoption. And, and she talked about the difference. And she said, you know, with, with the abortion, I, I felt like I had no choice. And, and so I had the abortion. And, and I live with the guilt of that every day now. And I feel so bad. And, and, um, and she's a Christian. And she said, you know, I know that that child is in heaven and, and I know that I'm forgiven. But, um, but, you know, it still bothers me. On the other hand, the child that I gave up for adoption, I'm still in touch with the family. Um, I know that she's doing well. They're so thankful to have this child and, and, you know, and, and it's great. And it's something that, you know, to celebrate and, um, you know, like there's nothing about abortion to celebrate, you know, even people who are advocates of it say, this is, this is not something that anybody ever strives for. Okay. But, but adoption is just, it's a tremendous blessing to everybody involved including the birth parent that gives up that child, all right? You're not a bad parent if you give up your child for adoption, all right? You're a good parent because if you're acknowledging that you can't take care of that child, all right, that you're saying, I'm setting aside what I want and I'm doing what's best for this child, all right? You know what? Some of the best parents out there are the ones that if, I mean, if there's some way to rate that, okay, if you are willing to give up that child because you care more about that child's well-being than actually being able to spend your life with them, all right, that's a huge sacrifice, all right, that's love, all right, and that's something to, that we should be celebrating and, and encouraging as a society, so you know, anyway, that's my rant, okay? But we really need to emphasize that more. It's a blessing. So, sorry. It's near yeah, no and dear problem. to my heart. No problem. So, uh, so I, it was an interesting, I thought it was an interesting discussion. Uh, 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 you know, I, I think, you know, how do we give money? How do we do it in good ways? What do we support, um, you know, with, with, with charitable dollars? I think it's pretty cool. Let's go. Interesting questions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of our listeners has thoughts. We'd always be interested in your concerns, your thoughts, your ideas on these things. Uh, these areas that I would say, little gray areas. Uh, might be a little bit interesting, and so we would, uh, you know, appreciate your thoughts and your uh, questions about it. If you have any thoughts, please contact us at podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Yep. So, thanks everybody. Have a uh, continue to have a blessed Lent. Um, love to hear from you. Yep. And oh, uh, just an update. Yeah. Last week we uh, discussed um, our. Uh, uh, the uh, Lutheran Child and Family Services of uh, of um, 
Illinois and uh, their view on gay adoption mm-hmm. and uh, things. And uh, there is a quote from the uh, uh, um, president's office, the LCMS, that says, uh, uh, so I asked some people out there in Northern Illinois what they've heard. And um, they said, uh, well, the Northern Illinois district president got a note. I'm trying to locate the note on my computer right now. I'm not having any luck doing that. Um, uh, but uh, ah, let's see if I can find it here. Just give me just a second here. But basically saying uh, the quote was not at all accurate. Um, it's not what was said. Um, oh, this is a... Uh, yeah, oh. You got it? Yeah, here it is. Um, this is from a circuit counselor out in uh, northern Illinois. I wanted to let you know that I spoke with uh, Pastor Don, Dan Gilbert regarding the article in the Tribune, which stated that LCFS will likely change its policies in order to abide by state law that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. He said the Tribune got it wrong. LCEF is working with the president's office to figure out how to deal with it, but a resolution passed at the 2007 convention directed LCFS not to participate in plastic placing children in foster care with gay couples, an LCAF plan is to abide by that resolution. Okay. And so, then he sent the uh, uh, resolution along with us. So the, uh, the paper okay. just totally got that wrong. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, uh, it'd be interesting to, um, yeah, uh, to see if the president's office wrote to uh, the Tribune and say, uh, you you really messed this up. Uh, this is not what well said at all. But, yeah, there'll yeah. be a retraction on page 37. This is yeah, why you but, should get your news from bloggers and podcasters. <laughs> like us, who get our news from websites. <laughs> so, anyway... Okay, so yeah, I wanted to update everybody up on that, just just to let them know how that's going. So, folks, God be with you. Give you a good week and be joyful, continuing life. Yeah. Good night, everybody. God bless.